Grace, peace, and mercy be with you all from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When's the last time you had a good cry? Last time that the news was just too much to bear? The last time your grief for that person you loved was so real that it turned your stomach over on itself? When's the last time you heard news of a promise you trusted that turned out to be a lie? When's the last time life just lined up in such a way that the only response you could have was a good catharsis? I ask because the catharsis is important. Life as we know it, life in this earth, with the things that happen, with the relationships and their fragility that we have, the kind of love that builds us up and then lets us down, is the kind of life where we have to have a good holy catharsis every now and then. We have to let our emotions be so honest that they move through us and out of us and within us. So that, yes, there are times when our faces know the pain of being crusted with the salt from too many tears. And yes, there are times when we feel like we're struggling to catch our breath because we're uttering cries that are like prayers too deep for words. But as people who can have that catharsis, we are also people who know what it is to be cleansed. We're a people who have enough good news in our lives that we can let our emotions out and trust that God will restore us to the kind of joy and life and peace that God hopes will be hallmarks of who we are. I ask you about the last time you had a good cry, the last time you had a good catharsis, because nobody wants to live in a family of stuffed-up emotions and feelings. Nobody wants to worship in a room full of people whose primary concern is looking good on the outside while everyone knows we're torn up within. That's the kind of congregation Jesus found himself in when he went to Capernaum with his disciples on the Sabbath when he began to teach. Jesus walked into their midst and he found a synagogue full of people who were faithful but whose primary concern was staying between the lines. They knew what psalms they were supposed to pray and they prayed them in a holy monotone the way they were taught to pray them. And they spoke the prescribed prayers of the faith that are beautiful and meaningful, but that also sometimes get thrown around so easily that we say their words without thinking of what they mean. Jesus walked into a synagogue where people had their prescribed place on their prescribed pew and where everybody came so that everybody would know they were the kind of people who had good decorum and knew how to behave appropriately at worship and everywhere else at life. And they came there to listen to scribes, scholars, who would tell them faithfully about all the old news that God had done in the history of their ancestors. And the scribes told them how God worked and walked with Adam and Eve, giving them life and giving them that necessary second chance when everything fell apart. They heard the scribes talk about how long ago our ancestors were in chains in slavery and God sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead them into a land of promise and freedom. But when Jesus walked into the synagogue, no one was prepared to hear about how God might have good news for us today. No one was prepared to hear how God walked 
with us through the evening breeze, taking in our confession of brokenness and giving us the world of a second chance. Nobody expected Jesus to walk in with the kind of teaching that addressed the chains and the shackles that held them bound in daily life where they might be set free to live and move and receive a new promise. And when Jesus came to them, they were astounded because Jesus wasn't simply following the rules. Jesus wasn't simply telling them about the good old things of the past. Jesus spoke to them with authority. He spoke as the author of a new reality. He spoke to them about psalms that are not just monotone expressions of yore, but living prayers of today. He taught them how to pray, not just with many words, but with meaningful words. And the people were astounded because it was so different than anything they had seen before. And we can only imagine how threatening it was to them, because they knew how to follow the rules, they knew how to keep it together, and how to look polished. But if Jesus was going to speak something new and something true, then their day-to-day -day true lives might have difficulty staying so bottled up. And it was one of those people, one man who couldn't take it any longer, who stood up like that can of soda that's been shook and is going to explode, or like that bottle of champagne where the cork is going to pop out. He stands up and he says, Jesus of Nazareth, I know what you're up to. I know that you're trying to do to me what God did to Adam and Eve when God interrupted their lives and gave them grace they weren't prepared for. I know that you're trying to pull me out of my chains the way God pulled the slaves out of the mud pit. You're trying to take it away from me, and this is the thing, Lord, I am comfortable with my chains. I am comforted by my shackles. And I am deathly afraid of having the kind of spirit of truth that talks about the shame that I feel, the letdown I experience, the lies that break my heart, the grief that steals my love away from me. I am deathly afraid of being so honest in my spirit that God or you or anyone else hears about what it really means to be me where I didn't live up to my parents' dreams, where I didn't live up to my own expectations, where I didn't fit the advertisers' descriptions of a good life, where I didn't have enough money to be counted with the wealthy and the powerful, where I walked past the people in need because I didn't trust they would actually use it for what I think they should use it. Jesus Christ, you are going to destroy me if you set that kind of spirit free because I have invested a lifetime in building myself up and protecting myself with the kind of walls that let me look respectable outside. Even if all the while my spirit within has gone stale and dank and become unclean. Jesus looked at that man in their assembly and he spoke to that unclean, bottled up, fenced in spirit. Jesus said to the man, stop talking. Stop letting your spirit tell you all these things that you've internalized as truth, that you're not good enough or pretty enough or young enough or smart enough. Stop listening to the messages that tell you that you are not strong enough to be honest. Stop spreading this rumor that you have to look like you are perfectly in charge of everything at every moment of all days. Stop this unclean thinking and be real. 
Be the image of God where the Spirit of God hovers over waters of rebirth and cleansing. Be real and let your spirit flow like rivers of justice and righteousness and peace. Give yourself the ability to be the image of a God who does cry when the world is unfair, whose heart does break when children are hurt, where neighbors are ignored, where wars are waged. Stop talking, Jesus says to the unclean spirit. And in fact, Jesus goes further. He says, stop these messages of death and come out of the man. You can't be bottled up any longer. You will kill him. Come out of him. And then something else happens in that synagogue on that Sabbath. People see that the man who stood up begins to shake. He begins to convulse. His body starts to show the signs of the catharsis he has lacked. And he can't speak words anymore. He can only cry out these loud cries. And suddenly, in the middle of that body of worship, there is a man reduced to tears and shaking and trembling and honesty and healing and purification And Jesus does not run away screaming and crying, terrified of the unclean spirit. Jesus rather stays with him and lets the catharsis set free everything that had been bottled up like a stone in front of a tomb. And now the people are amazed. It was astounding to them that Jesus would talk in a different way, but it's amazing to them that Jesus would set someone free, that Jesus would look at our lives and say, it is more important to God that you are real and you are healthy and you are honest and you're truthful. It is more important to God for you to let everything out, even when it is just shaking and crying, because within those sighs too deep for words is the openness to a new life that doesn't hide who you are, but allows you to walk in newness as sons and daughters of God. And the rumor starts to spread from that synagogue outwards that in Jesus we are no longer just trying to look good. We're actually living now. And the rumor extends to places down the line thousands of years later like this room where we come together. Where if we wanted to, we could just put on our Sunday best and recite empty phrases but rather we're met here by a Christ who says, stop speaking the words that hold you back and let your spirit out for a life that counts. Because here among you, here in this place, there is something new and cleansing happening. And from here, as the rumor extends in our neighborhoods, our homes, our schools, our workplaces, as the rumor extends that this is the truth of God, not a good show, but a real life, then the fame of Jesus will actually count for something. As we're cleansed from what we hold in, to be those who follow Him in giving all that we are, for the sake of a world finally being set free to reconciliation and thanksgiving to the friend we have in our Lord now and always. Amen.